for university. Prof. Paul will also join online. Now, I would like to introduce the chair of this plenary session to Professor Dr. Dr. Gigi Widowati Siswo Miharjo, MS. Professor Widowati is a lecturer in biomedic biomedical engineering, engineering study program at UGM Graduate School. Without uh, further ado, Professor Widowati, we invite you and also the speaker to the stage. Prof. Widowati, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Selamat pagi. Good morning, our distinguished speakers. Also, good morning, all participants. It is really my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. And in the second day, we will have three speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Unda and two others will join us through the online. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we will start with our first speaker. She's here next to me, Dr. Undal Gambatar. She's program specialist from the UNESCO Jakarta office. And as far as I understand, she's very familiar with Indonesia and also with Gajah Mada. Yeah, I know that she has uh, cooperation with one of the faculty here in Gajah Mada. Well, Dr. Uno, time is yours. You have 20, 20 minutes. Thank you. Discussion Thank will be followed after the three speakers. Thank you so much, Ibu. Um, Selamat pagi. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's um, a, a real pleasure and honor to be um, invited to this um, conference of scholars to talk about um, our work um, let's say in the practical sense about um, um, AI um, uh, policy and um, ethical AI and you know the capacity building and normative work we are um, doing in that space. Yesterday I was in some of the parallel sessions and there was a lot of um, uh, research on AI um, coming from you know the graduate school. Um, you know Professor Dickey told me that you know out of the hundred and more. Um, papers uh, submitted, you know, 13 were, you know, on, on AI ethics, which is a fantastic number, I think. It's, it's really, um, um, you know, um, great that so much uh, literature on, on ethical AI is coming from um, UGM Graduate School. I think that's, that's, a, that's a really nice um, thing to note. So it's, it's an honor for me to share my own experience um, in, in, in this um, space as well. So um, in order to kind of um, um, explain why um, UNESCO works on um, um, ethical AI, I think I will just speak a little bit first about um, um, the section that I belong to and, and the bioethics um, work um, that goes on there because that's where the um, uh, work on AI ethics um, originates from. Um, a lot of people, when I've, you know, I've been doing these conferences and workshops on ethical AI since 2021 and 2022, and you know, people think, oh, you're, you know, you're, maybe you're supposed to be a cultural, you know, you know, inspector. You're not, you know, you know, UNESCO is like, you know, the UN agency on on culture. Why are you, you know, why you're talking about this? So, I've kind of had to explain, um, 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 you know, the context. So let me um, let me start with that. So as um, you can see from the first. Um, um, slide of, of my presentation. Um, I uh, work within the social and human sciences sector of uh, UNESCO. It's one of the five pillars. UNESCO, of course, standing for education, the sciences, the natural and social sciences, um, culture um, um, organization of, of the United um, um, Nations. We are a specialized agency uh, with um, member states um, from whom we derive our, our mandate. Um, so within my um, um, sector, we have uh, had the bioethics and ethics of science and technology program for a very long time, since basically the inception of UNESCO, you know, in you know, um, in the 1950s. So it does um, a number of um, different things. Um, um, one, it um, 
kind of deliberates on the um, um, frontier technological and scientific advancements of the time and ponders the ethical and you know societal and policy implications of you know whatever that you know technology or scientific you know breakthrough might be. Um, it develops normative standards, global standards um, around you know these um, issues, and then it helps uh, member states. It assists member states in translating those normative guidelines into tangible um, policy at the um, national level. <laughs> I do apologize. I mean, it, um, then it translates uh, that into um, tangible policy at, at the national level. So it has a standard setting component and a um, capacity building and um, um, other um, components. Uh, we house the International Bioethics Committee, which is, um, um, you know, we say it's you know the only global forum for reflection in bioethics. Of course, there are national and uh, regional um, platforms, but you know we're proud to host this. Um, um, a global um, um, network. Um, it was created in uh, 1993. Um, it's a body of independent um, experts from you know all of our um, uh, you know, regions where we have you know member states and uh, representation, um, and uh, it, it's from these um, experts that we that we have um, um, the um, intellectual you know um, powerhouse to develop these um, normative um, standard setting um, 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 guidelines and and so forth. So um, that's sort of the context for where the um, 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 recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence comes from. Um, you know, with the recognition that you know UNESCO had this you know long you know decades long expertise in um, um, you know normative work in bioethics and ethics of science and technology, we were requested by our member states to develop a normative instrument on artificial intelligence in 2019. So let me um, move forward to the um, next slide. Uh, maybe the moderator could um, um, help me with that if, if the remote is not working. Right. So as um, um, as I said, that's um, the you know the body or the the you know section in the house that was uh, working on this um, uh, uh, recommendation on AI ethics. It was a you know, very intense um, two-year process um, led by the ad hoc expert group uh, on, on AI. Um, it was adopted at the general conference um, in 2021. Um, at the time, it was 193 member states that adopted it with, you know, acclamation. Um, and since then, the United States has rejoined UNESCO, so it is now 194 countries that are party to this um, um, document. And the you know, let's say the capacity building work or the implementation, um, you know, broadly started the next year with, you know, we have um, some regional networks, you know, we call it the Friends at the Recommendation. We have some, you know, sub-regional work in, you know, Latin America, you know, with ASEAN, we're, you know, looking at the same approach of looking at it, you know, as a regional interest block um, and, and, and so on. Um, Go on. So just to kind of introduce what's in, in the framework, I, I know that, you know, there are a lot of, um, Ethical guidelines and um, um, you know um, you know similar coming from you know different um, bodies. Um, so within the UNESCO um, uh, framework, it, it looks at you know these four values and and um, and also these principles. Um, obviously, you can see it on, on the big screen. So I will just maybe highlight a couple that I think of are of um, particular interest. Um, I do think it's quite interesting that we've um, uh, put environmental and ecosystem flourishing within principal values as it pertains to um, ethical AI because it, you know if you think about the you know the human impact that we have on the you know earth that, that we live in um, when you're thinking about you know the massive amounts of data and you know resources it takes to you know uh, sorry massive amounts of energy and resources it takes to um, process data that you know the, to train you know AI models, um, you know, it does have um, a impact on, on, you know, on, you know, um, on the on the living planet, really, basically. Um, so I think it's it's um, it's interesting that we, you know, try to you know consider this human footprint of you know digital, you know, technology and you know like you know, modern you know, advancement and um, and how that affects um, um, uh, us in you know 
you know, living through this sort of you know, triple planetary crisis of which, you know, climate change is one. It is a conversation I think that we should have in relation to, you know, um, um, AI ethics and, and so forth. Um, principles, um, I, you know, uh, I think they're quite um, self-evident as well. Um, um, I find you know human oversight and determination you know quite um, uh, interesting and, and worthy of um, of highlighting you know the concept that you know, AI should always be explainable how it works you know how um, you know how the models are trained and, and so forth and um, that there should always be a human um, who has ultimate um, accountability because you cannot say oh you know like oh, you know this just happened like there there must always be a human being who is capable of taking ownership and accountability for. Um, you know, whatever um, um, you know, decision making might have um, happened. I won't mention which um, country, but I was in a country in the region, and um, 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 he was a government official, and he was talking about, oh, you know, like AI is going to be fantastic. You know, we're going to use it in the courts. You know, we're going to have like no more you know backlog in the criminal court system. We're just going to use AI to you know like sentence people, and it's going to be fantastic. The judge's workload is is going to be like um, totally reduced, and um, that was that was um, quite horrifying to me, honestly, too. Um, to hear to hear that, and a lot of the, you know the lawyers and the um, and civic society people in, in the room were like, you know, but what about human oversight? What about you know human accountability? Like you can't, you know, only humans can take you know accountability in 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 in, in front of in the front of the law. Um, so you know these are some of the um, uh, principles that we think globally um, we can all agree on as it pertains to ethical AI. So having developed these uh, values and principles, um, uh, UNESCO also identified um, these policy um, um, areas um, that are cross-cutting with um, um, AI um, um, ethics. Um, again, I will, you know, you can read through them, so I will highlight just a couple that I think are interesting. Um, education, AI and education, that's been a, you know, like a big um, thematic interest for you know many um, you know uh, you know academics and um, you know ministries of education and and so forth. In fact, right now, colleagues at the UNESCO Bangkok office they're hosting a big you know um, conference on AI in, in higher education and you know how how should you know large language models be used in the classroom? You know if it should be um, um, and um, you know how we can interact with you know artificial intelligence within within that, that space. I think I will also highlight um, culture as well because, um, um, you know, as I said, you know, UNESCO is the um, agency mandated to work on the sciences and, and uh, education and culture, and particularly here in um, UGM and with the Jogja community, I've been having really interesting conversations about um, how AI is disrupting the creative um, industry. Um, you know, questions of, you know, if. If you know graphic design or you know artists um, or you know you know anyone who you know, you know creates something um, in the arts and you know does it as a living, um, if you know AI is sort of um, you know generating images or generating artwork, um, you know questions of copyright, um, you know questions of you know it's it's you know in, in intellectual work done by humans that go into training these models so. Are you also, um, in a way, um, eligible for um, um, pr profit or you know compensation from your intellectual work that went into this, you know, training an AI model that you know generates images um, and so forth? So it's been really um, cool that um, that conversation began, you know, in in in, in the community here in in Jogja. That's um, that's really you know, fant fantastic to me. Um, and you know, even you know, thinking about you know recent strikes in in the um, you know film and media industry in in, in the United States, um, you know, a lot of the conversation was about look, you cannot be talking about you know, oh, you know, we don't need you know screenwriters anymore, like you know, we're just going to have you know AI you know do do that, or um, we don't need to you know pay to hire um, background actors, we can you know just generate you know images and. Um, and you know that has an impact on the economy. It has an impact on you know li livelihood, you know, jobs in the creative industry, um, you know people's you know um, um, you know labor market compensation. So you know like it. it um, I, I think my point is it, it ties into um, some other bigger um, questions as 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 well. Um, and, you know because we've been doing like a um, at UNESCO we've been do doing a. Um, uh, review of AI strategies in in Southeast Asia. We we have an upcoming publication on 
um, the Southeast Asia AI uh, policy landscape review, where we've been looking at what are the priority sectors um, of um, uh, national governments as it pertains to AI you know, development and harnessing AI technology. And most countries in the region, you know, they said you know, AI is gonna be like a um, driver for change in the e-commerce industry, in, um, in um, you know, trade and um, 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 agriculture, but you know, very few countries have identified you know, this linkage between um, AI and you know, the creative economy or the creative um, um, industry. So I think um, at UNESCO, this is something that we kind of wanna delve into as well in, um, as, as a, um, a topic of interest. So let me move um, on. So having developed this um, uh, recommendation, yeah, um, it's, you know, it's only as good as its um, implementation, and we've developed some tools and platforms to help, um, 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 you know, to help us to achieve this or to help member states achieve this. We have two assessment tools. One is the readiness assessment methodology. Um, the second is the ethical impact assessment, and they sort of have very similar names. So. In my next slide, I will kind of go into detail about what, what are the differences and um, 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 you know, what it does. Um, but basically, the readiness assessment methodology is something that we are proposing to um, national governments to help them um, um, evaluate where they are in terms of um, you know, um, readiness um, for, for AI. It's not meant to be a competitive ranking uh, process. It's not, you know, Singapore is number one in the region, Singapore is great, um, this country is lagging behind. It, that's not the in intention. It's really to look at, um, um, you know, the regulatory, um, policy, um, socioeconomic, um, and um, other dimensions of, um, of AI. Um, um, de development. So having done this um, readiness um, assessment, right now we are, um, um, we have it um, in, in um, um, uh, active implementation in 40 plus countries across our different field offices. Um, at the end of the month I will go to um, Philippines where you know, we will rant, uh, launch this readiness assessment or RAM um, with um, uh, national stakeholders there um, end of November. Um, and the output is a country analysis report with policy recommendations. Um, they go into what is called the Observatory of AI Ethics, which is at the very um, uh, bottom of, of this um, uh, list, um, uh, to collate this um, 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 country um, um, profiles from, from you know, as many countries you know, across the world as we can um, um, include. Um, there you would be able to you know, cross compare with you know, different countries or different regions. You would be able to extrapolate you know, some findings and at the request of our member states, uh, we would um, deploy um, um, experts from within our networks uh, that are part of this AI Experts Without Borders um, uh, platform. Um, and they could be deployed to give very targeted interventions, technical advice, technical support at the behest or and at the request of, of member states. So it's a three um, layer um, implementation um, plan. We also have, um, um, yeah, like a high level you know, annual event at the minister level on, on AI ethics. Last year it was in um, Prague in the Czech Republic. We were um, very honored to have a representative from Indonesia um, there to talk about the Stranas Ka and all the great work that um, is being done in um, Indonesia. The next iteration will be in Slovenia. Um, also, um, Women for Ethical AI Network. Again, this is you know just kind of looking at the gender um, perspective. Yesterday, one of the uh, papers was talking about you know how AI is you know kind of um, exaggerating gender inequality because you know it, it um, you know like AI advertising it you know kind of perpetuates this you know um, you know cycle of viewing um, female bodies it's in up you know for up for you know objectification and view by you know like the, you know like the male gaze so it was a really really interesting um, paper on you know on the body politic and um, um, and it, it, that was really fantastic so I was you know so thrilled to to see that and be you know attending that parallel session because it's really um resonates with you know some of the work that we are trying to do as well again so this is just um, a little bit of an explanation on the difference between the um, assessment um, tools. Um, the readiness assessment is targeted towards uh, member states, governments, and the ethical um, impact assessment is more towards um, you know, um, the private sector or companies or anyone who is um, um, developing and um, uh, yeah, deploying AI technology to help them assess the ethical you know, uh, risks across the life cycle of the AI 
um, tool. Um, and yesterday, um, Pak Yan was you know, talking a bit about you know, like, you know, businesses and, and their responsibility to have ethics and, and accountability. Um, and I think this is something that will help um, 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 you know, companies and, and, and um, uh, businesses to, to be um, um, accountable for, um, um, for you know, what they are you know, developing and um, deploying as, as it pertains to AI technologies. I, I do have some additional thoughts there, but you know, just in the interest of time, maybe I will move forward and maybe the moderator Actually, can... Your time is... Uh, is over. It's almost over. Almost, okay. Almost. <laughs> okay. I will, I will try to um, speed run through my um, presentation and then perhaps in the discussion, you know, I can kind of um, talk about some of the other thoughts because clearly I, I have a lot. Um, uh, so uh, let me just um, um, quickly uh, wrap up. This is here at um, UGM with you know dear dear um, friends at um, UGM. This is the philosophy um, department uh, where we did this um, 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 publication um, contextualizing the global um, um, normative guideline, the UNESCO recommendation into you know national values of Panchasila because. You know, one of the criticisms can be, oh, you know, you know, a, 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 a norms in, in AI ethics. It's driven by, you know, like you know, Western experts. It's you know, developed in Paris. It's you know, um, um, a, a, you know, a, maybe like we weren't, you know, so um, um, uh, consulted. So you know, we tried to kind of um, um, interlinkage, you know, these global norms into Panchasila, into the five principles, and you know, really um, make the case that AI ethics are, um, in, you know, in, in Indonesian um, ethics and AI values are Indonesian. Uh, values and again, it's something I would I, I, please ask me a question about this because I, I would I would really like to you know go more into detail about this in in the um, discussion um, uh, portion of this um, panel. Um, again, uh, this is, is something I was talking about earlier about the um, um, the creative economy and you know creative um, industry. You know, we did this again you know with um, people in the uh, Jogja community and with um, academics from UGM. We did this um, 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 uh, collaboration earlier this year. I believe it was in March. Um, uh, very interesting. I'll just um, um, I'll just leave it on the screen. Um, so I'm on time after all. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, who is already joining us? Is it Dr. Uh, Osa or Dr. Martens? Uh, both of them already joined in the Zoom. Okay, so based on the schedule, then uh, I will invite Dr. Preeti Oza. Hello, Dr. Oza. Hello, Hello everyone. Yes, Namaste. Can you hear me? Can you see us? I can, I can, I can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, we will now, we will have now our second speaker. Dr. Preeti Oza from St. Andrews College, University of Mumbai, India. Well, it's your time. You have 20 minutes for the presentation. So, so very much. Wishing everyone a very warm and happy, happy good, good morning, morning from, from India, Mumbai. Mumbai. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Jagya is enjoying this very interesting international conference. conference. A very uh, special thanks, thanks to Dear friend, friend, friend Professor Dick Sarjan and uh, Professor Paul. Hello, Hello friends. And uh, this, this time, time I'm missing being with you all in a very beautiful place at your university. university. But, but it's, it's an, an honor, honor to join such a wonderful, wonderful conference in an online, online mode. mode. And uh, uh, as our previous speaker has already started our day with a very, you know, relevant talk on. Uh, the artificial intelligence and how the, the highest and most respected body in the world is already uh, talking about it in you know, multiple areas and multiple arenas. So um, just I feel that my, my talk is uh, almost a sort of an extension to my previous speakers' you know, um, references and a lot of uh, you know, deliberations of a similar topic. So, um, how, how do I share, share my PPT? Because I have already shared, and can, can I share from my side, side or how do I do it? I have shared, shared my slides with the. Yes, maybe, uh, if maybe it is easier for you if you share from your side. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so, please, please allow, allow me to share my screen.
Can I share my screen? Not yet. Yes. So, yes. Uh, yes. Do you have my screen? Yeah, we already can see. So, um, as, as I already told, told you, that this is an extension of the previous talk, talk and our very, uh, you know, um, concerned um, area for all of us being like academicians. So, the, the idea, idea of using artificial intelligence in education and uh, again, again, another very important aspect for all, all of us is how um, the ethics in pedagogy um, is, um, you know, being, being questioned, questioned now with this um, kind of very, very newer technology and uh, which, which is a very, very very tricky balance for all of us to maintain that is balancing promise and responsibility because um, as, as we all know, know that we are dealing with a very um, you know changing and very uh, sort of a frenzy time now we all are witnessing a sort of a history in making when we are dealing with a lot, a lot of, of machines, machines in our lives, and the machines have now entered into um, very uh, you know niche human areas like um, intelligence, uh, emotions, thinking, feelings, and, and this is where um, we have to maintain the balance um, in how to leverage all these technologies, which are like you know meaning a lot of areas. I mean. Sometimes it is really scary to see where the technology is taking us. But at the same time, as we all are dealing with our students at the universities and colleges and levels and then the kind of impressionable minds we are all dealing with day in and day out, I guess this is a prime job for the academicians to understand um, uh, the kind of interconnectedness between uh, artificial intelligence and um, you know, education. And, and also uh, ethics and education. So, so my talk will be um, dealing with um, both the things. Is, is my slide changing? changing? Yes. I'm changing my slide. Is this changing? Yeah. Yeah, it's sorry. Yes. yes. Thank you. So, uh, this is a very interesting, interesting take. Um, you know, basically, I would, I would like to start with um, what, what is the UNESCO's a new report saying. It says that, that AI in education has the potential to democratize learning, but it also presents challenges in safeguarding the dignity and autonomy of learners. Now, now this, this is a very, very kind of a guarded report given to all of us um, um, by UNESCO in um, the area of AI in education. So, so that there are advantages and disadvantages that we all can, can see it to incorporate um, AI-driven tools and technology into teaching methods as, um, as and when the AI is progressing. Now, uh, when we are looking at it with a very specific focus on ethical concerns that uh, the policy makers and educators like we all, we must confront uh, now, we should be, we are like almost on the verge of taking it head on to guarantee the ethical implementation of AI in teaching. So, so when, when we are looking, looking at it, um, looking at the, the, the background part of it, ethics in a pedagogy is not an afterthought, but a fundamental consideration, and ensuring that educational technologies promote the well-being and the development of all learners. Now, now this is a very, very responsible statement coming to us, uh, and when we say that the intersection of AI and education represents a dynamic field with both um, you know, know promising advancements and at the same time giving us a lot of ethical complexities. So, so understanding the historical timeline of AI's use in education can take us back into uh, you know, a little bit of uh, recent history uh, and uh, it can put us into a better position that from where we have started and now where we are going through this very frenzied time, where are we going with the use of um, you know, uh, in increasing um, use, use of AI. So, so the increasing diversity of learners coupled with the need for both personalized and adaptable educational experiences has created a very ripe environment for AI integration. Now, um, 
Yeah, yeah, integration, integration when we are looking, looking at, at it. it. Let me just go to, to my slide, slide and, and this is something which we have already experienced. We have, already experienced. We we have, we have been, been through this kind of you know, changes. So, so when, when we are, are looking at it, um, maybe the uh, 60s and 70s, we can uh, you know, trace, trace it back, back to the early computer, computer system instructions and uh, automated, automated teaching of operations. operations. Though these, these were all limited to, you know, very uh, niche tech savvy uh, labs and, uh, you know, areas of the departments across the universities. But, but then we have started seeing the impact. Uh, maybe in the 80s and 90s, we have also um, come across um, intelligent tutoring systems. And in the 90s, has become, you know, so more or less when we have started um, LMS, that is a local management system that happens to uh, the online teaching uh, two or three years back during the COVID um, you know, phase. Um, we have somehow you know, evolved this, this intelligent tutoring system, which was um, started somewhere in the 1990s. Then uh, gradually the advent of online education platforms like MOOCs and you know, you know, other uh, courses. Coursera and, 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 and like it, it was the, the, the word which was given to this is massive and it was really massive um, when, when we wanted to look at it in a little larger, larger background uh, you know of um, the, or maybe the, the context, context of globally opening the education. So in 2000 uh, we have seen many um, AI enhanced learning experiences and in the last maybe 20, 20 years, 10, 10 years, 10, 10, 10 to 13 years, 12 years. Uh, it is seen as the surge in AI applications and then your lingo and so many other examples of augmented realities and you know, virtual realities. So these are uh, the areas which um, were there as a niche experiment, but AI was there as a part of education. So now when we are dealing with it, it's not that suddenly we are coming across to something which was given to us or which is coming to us. So, um, with with reference to these very, very, you know, not, not primitive, primitive, but very limited, limited experiments in the areas of AI, AI uh, when we look at it from, uh, you know, from the point, point of view of timeline and genealogy, it's, it's a very interesting statement which I, uh, you know, came across. It says that AI can be a powerful tool in education, education but, but it must be developed and used ethically with, with the focus, focus of the best interest of students and a commitment to equity. Now, now I remember uh, my, my uh, fellow speaker's statement about uh, using AI with specific reference to you know, women or maybe the other you know, um, kind of a marginal or very focused uh, targeted I would say kind of an, uh, you know, environment. This, this is a very very important statement which is reminding us to go back to the concept of equity, irrespective of what kind of technology we all have been using. So, uh, with reference to uh, timeline and genealogy, um, let me just uh, take you to a very interesting part of it. This is saying that the, the question is not whether technology will disrupt education, but rather how do we harness this transformation for, for the betterment of learners. So, um, ethical, ethical consideration, consideration when, when we are looking at it, um, it, it is always a part of you know, question. The, the, the question is coming from two areas. First area is um, ethical data collection. And the second area is about the consent and uh, student privacy. So, um, these are some of the examples which uh, were there. Um, you know, extended with, with reference to uh, ethical data collection and ethical consideration. So when we are looking, looking at it, um, how, uh, how the role of a teacher or the educator or the entire concept of pedagogy that is a teaching learning you know, kind of uh, phase, how this has changed with the use of um, artificial intelligence and how many new questions or the new um, um, uh, challenges have come across uh, to, to all of us, to all the, it's not only a part of the educators or maybe the teacher student now, because um, let me give you a very, you know, 
personal example. Uh, a few days, days back, and right, right now, University of Mumbai is going to um, the examination. Semester ends, semester is going to end now in two days. And um, the examination, there are certain areas where we have opened up uh, the exam pattern and then we, we have asked students to prepare a kind of a you know, real life project. project. They, they can come and um, present in front of us. Uh, to, to our surprise, surprise and uh, sometimes to our shock, um, when our, our, uh, our teachers, assessors, and evaluators, uh, we have started seeing a very heavy use of machine language. That means, in respect of chat GPT or Jenny or any other you know, kind of a, um, artificial intelligence models, but then we have started seeing a very I would also like to put that word irresponsible use of machine language in the writing, in the presentations. That means uh, this is high time for all of us to basically teach the idea of teach the you know concept of how to responsibly use ChatGPT or any other AI for that matter. Uh, and this is also a kind of a and if I, I, I take you all back, maybe just 15 years back, um, when we started having very interesting, uh, you know, kind of um, um, uh, data um, online. And, and I would say when the internet was opened up for all of us. Now I'm, I'm, my, my, my examples will be limited to the place where I'm coming, that's India, South Asia, and related parts. So I'm not comparing the places with the other Western counterparts of it. But, um, what, what my, 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 you know, kind of an analogy goes is that, that when we have started using, when we have started seeing a very interesting and very huge www, www World Wide Web, web and, and that was also the time for all of us to just, you know, you know, dive into the kind of Wikipedias and a lot of other medias and a lot, lot of online content. And many, many of us, we also were very tempted to go for the copy-paste content and then, you know, coming up with a very interesting writer or something like that. That was the time when we had experience that though the content is very, very huge, there is a way to deal and to engage with that content in a responsible way. And then we have gradually started, you know, putting our students and learners through that concept of um, similarity content or maybe what we use the word, not very pleasant word for plagiarism. And, and we have started making them, you know, uh, understand that, that um, these are the contents available, free to use, but not, I mean, use it with your responsibility, use it in a structured manner. Now, now this is another time for all of us to go back into that kind of a thing where we have to actually take certain steps, structured steps, and I'm happy that this kind of a very interesting conference is happening and a lot of deliberations are happening, that how do we take it further? Because ethical consideration is, as we have already seen, a very important part of our pedagogy or not only pedagogy, almost all these areas of, uh, you know, our lives as, as uh, educators, academicians. So, um, as I was coming back to two very important concerns for all of us, you know, first is ethical data connection and um, um, consent, of course, and student privacy. Now, now the ethical, ethical, this is another, you know, important quote I have come across. They say that ethical use of AI in education demands a very delicate balance between um, persons, uh, you know, personal space and private space and, you know, um, generic space. Efficiency, equity, innovation and ethics. Now these are very important keywords for all of us when we are looking at um, uh, very basic thing like ethical data collection. Now, how do we, uh, how do we, uh, you know, take um, these areas? I just would like, like to say, my, is my slide changing for you? Yes. Because sometimes it just gets stuck. I'm changing my slides. Is it coming uh, to the audience? So, the way I'm changing it. But uh, you st uh, your time is almost finished. You still yes. have four yes. minutes. Yes, I will, I will just sum it up. So, um, uh, as I have just you know, raised a certain query, I, I don't wish to reply or answer or maybe sort out this query because this is a time for all of us to, to uh, you know, get more and more queries. 
to consider that these are the questions and then collectively find answers. So certain areas where we can say that um, uh, consent and data collection comes, this is parental consent in primary schools, mainly college students' consent for research, uh, secure cloud storage in online learning, um, an anonymous feedback system, student-controlled portfolios, limited data retention, and biometric data protection. Because we have all experienced that many of the institutions have already started using or reusing or even duplicating the videos or maybe the online sessions and lectures without getting consent of the faculty or the teachers or something. So there is a serious need now to balance this AI um, and human collaboration in education. So, so as I have told you that, that, uh, that another area is teacher-student teacher relation in AI-enhanced classroom and uh, balancing AI and human instruction. So where do we stand as a teacher? Where do or how do we evolve in that AI-enhanced classroom? Because now we are uh, virtually, you know, kind of a big stand um, from a lot of other areas and dimensions from our students. So it's a powerful tool for trans transformation. It, it can, can deliver immediate feedback, but, but at the same time, um, we do have to consider the potential for a very dynamic and personalized education system. Why personalized? Because um, here the data is all about us and we are all about our data. So uh, certain some of the ethical implications I have already put it on my screen. So um, finally, we would like to you know, sum it up uh, with, a, with a kind of a saying that Combination of AI and ethics, very, very important for all of us to um, consider right now. But ethically sound future in AI enhanced education um, will definitely improve learning. And at the same time, um, if we can take care of upholding privacy, justice, and equity from our side. So this was my talk. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And now we will have our third speaker. Hello, Dr. Paul Martens. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. I know this must be uh, late night, or what time is it in your country? Oh, yeah. it's not too late. It's just after 8 o'clock in the evening. OK. Well. Uh, our third sp uh, speaker is Paul Martens, Dr. Paul Martens. He is Associate Professor of Ethics in Baylor University, Texas, United States. So it's time yours. Uh, you have 20 minutes for the presentation. Thank, Thank you, Professor Wadawaki, uh, fellow panelists and conference, conference organizers. Um, appreciate it again. It is good to see you. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity um, to uh, join you this morning, and I'm very sorry that I cannot be there in person. I had planned to be there. Nevertheless, in the next few minutes, I would like to focus on the deep disjunction between the aspirational rhetoric surrounding AI, some of which we've heard already this morning, and the real-world ambitions and investments in AI. So in doing so, I will sharpen the importance of human dignity as it functions within the socio-technical systems we inhabit. So part, so part one, one, the aspirational rhetoric of artificial intelligence. If you've been working in academic circles during the past year, I don't need to tell you how quickly and pervasively AI has become part of our ecosystem. Whether we like it or not, ChatGPT has become the symbolic flag bearer of a new generation of academic tools that promise to automate tasks, provide insight, and generate conversation. Now, similar sorts of tools have been created for artists, businesses, healthcare, and even this Zoom platform. This is a new reality, and there are many who celebrate these tools as clear demonstrations that AI can be a great service to humanity. For others, however, these tools are merely the beginning. All the examples I've given above are merely applications of what could be called AI in weak or a narrow sense. That is, they exemplify a kind of machine learning in which patterns in the input data are recognized and outputs are then provided that approximate that data. In effect, these tools operate using brute force, massive amounts of data, and then simplify their output like an effective search engine. 
Beyond this form of AI lies a qualitatively different type of AI, the holy grail for AI research today, namely artificial general intelligence. Now, the goal of artificial general intelligence, or anthropoidic AI, is to think beyond previous experience, to think with creativity, and to function as a human mind. In this sense, the outputs of general AI would be driven both by a rich array of data and creative intuition that it would select and draw upon this relevant data. One of the leaders in this field is Oceanit, a mind-to-market company headquartered in Honolulu, Hawaii, that claims to practice, and then I quote, intellectual anarchy to blend interdisciplinary science, technology, engineering, <clears throat> and innovative thinking to benefit our global community. That sounds great and it seeks to reimagine innovation and solve the impossible. Well, from that perspective, their ambitions for world peace are as expansive as I've seen, and they go on to state, anthropoidic AI will revolutionize life, the universe, and everything, including the military. If we succeed in creating an anthropoidic AI, it will be a human in all the intellectual and moral senses that count, and they continue, since this human-level, human-style intelligence will run on superhuman hardware, intelligent problem-solving will be maximized. Now, war is an outstanding but solvable problem. Ergo, the beginning of anthropoidic AI could be the end of war. And that surely is the ultimate objective of the U.S. military. That's what they claim. So hearing these claims, one is tempted to chuckle a bit at this self-descriptive hyperbole until one realizes that these labs are dead serious to the tune of $80 million in funding from the U.S. Department of Defense in recent years. And this brings us very quickly back to the discussion of the real-world ambitions surrounding AI. So part two, real-world ambitions of AI. Artificial intelligence, of course, does not exist in a vacuum. It is a small part of a large socio-technical system that includes non-intelligent machines, software, people, communities and culture, and the natural world. And in essence, the values and use of AI are usually determined within this broader matrix. And briefly glancing at who is investing in AI reveals a considerable amount about the real-world ambitions for those seeking to utilize AI. So on the one hand, we have large multinational corporations that are investing heavily in AI. And you can look at Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Apple, Foxconn, and even Volkswagen. These are leading the way in funding. Now, competitive economic advantage is the driving force here. And no one wants to be left behind without the newest industry tools. Leading applications are frequently healthcare especially the use of AI to generate automatic responses or diagnoses to common patient queries to uh, form a kind of virtual care, if you will. And of course, there are other applications in finance, engineering, and the life sciences that are obvious. And in this context, we've even found that there's business or industry resistance to the use of AI ethics with a strong preference for quote-unquote responsible AI. Now, on the other hand, China, Russia, the U.S., and among others, are deeply committed to a new form of the global arms race in AI. And very clearly, the U.S. acknowledging that it cannot compete on the machine learning level of AI with more heavily managed societies, quote, unquote, because of the relative restrictions on collecting data, they're turning increasingly to the development of general artificial intelligence. Now, now, whether, whether better, better equipping warfighters fighters or expanding information gathering or streamlining command and control decision making, the militarization of AI is already in full swing. As, as we've already seen, the logic is simple. War is an outstanding but solvable problem. Therefore, the beginning of anthropoidic AI could be the end of war. And then this brings us back to the failure of these many aspirational statements. So, so part, part three, three current, current failures. Now, now as, as we've already seen, seen the, the UNESCO, UNESCO published a recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence in 2021. 
It is, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful human rights oriented, rights oriented document with, with clear, clear objectives, objectives, values and principles and areas of policy, policy action. action. Yet, Yet looking, looking around at the development and use of AI and with, with all apologies to our former our presenter from, from UNESCO, it is, it is clear, clear that it seems to float above reality in a series of um, as, as a series, series of essential ideals that, that is rhetorically embraced, but frequently ignored as a, as a kind, kind of ethics washing. washing. Now, now, allow, allow me, me to illustrate with reference to human dignity one of the, of the core values of the UNESCO document. document. Paragraph, Paragraph 13, 13 of the document states, states the following, <clears throat> and I, and I quote, quote, The inviolable and inherent dignity of every, every human constitutes the foundation for, for the universal, universal indivisible, inalienable, interdependent and interrelated system of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Therefore, respect, protection, and promotion of human dignity and rights as established by international law, including international human law, is essential through the life cycle of AI systems. And I continue. Human dignity relates to the recognition of the intrinsic and equal worth of each individual human being, regardless of race, color, descent, gender, age, language, religion, political opinion, national origin, ethnic origin, social origin, economic or social condition of birth or disability and any other grounds. Now, now this is exceptional and it's thorough and it's worthy of embracing. Yet, Yet there is something intrinsic to AI that immediately poses a challenge to this affirmation. Simply stated, the use, the use of AI usually assumes that the important aspects of humans can be quantified as data that are then, then subjected to evaluation and aggregation, which is, which is then available as raw material, material for an algorithm to appropriate according to the desires of a software programmer. Now, now humans are effectively reinscribed in the new equality, not, not as inviolable individual beings integral to a society, but as, but as sources, sources of raw data that can, can be monetized for economic gain. gain. Now, now, I understand, understand this is a rather grim assessment, assessment of AI's, AI's use of big data, data but, it but it allows me to illustrate with three brief examples in the time we have left this morning. So I want to look at three quick examples. First is ChatGPT. Now, there are many that argue that ChatGPT is a threat to critical thinking and that careful practice is needed to communicate, and they're probably right. And Preeti has given us a clear indication of that as well. But even in this relatively innocuous example, it is worth noting that one of the most subversive elements of ChatGPT is its implicit assumption that communication can occur while eliding the relationship between the creator and receiver of that communication. That is to say that the important part of writing is the depersonalized information and not the relationship between the creator and receiver created through the communication. There is no one responsible for writing and or reading the information. All there is is automatically generated word patterns. Now, to my mind, from a systems approach, this undermines the contextualized dignity of all involved. Example two, healthcare. In many of our countries, efficiency in healthcare is sought at all costs. While there are many good rationales given for the need to integrate AI here, the effect is almost universally dehumanizing. When faced with a medical problem, people need attention to the idiosyncrasies of that medical problem. Yet, there is a place, yes, there is a place for providing general information relating to common maladies, and the internet is already full of this sort of information. But spending billions to create an AI-powered frontline response to patients in their moment of need runs patently counter to an affirmation of the dignity and worth of those patients. And anyone who has found themselves on an endless loop trying to get information from an automated phone knows what that feeling all too well. And there is no doubt these sorts of algorithms may be used by insurance companies here in the US to automatically deny unusual treatments and reimbursement for uncommon procedures. And even worse, let's look at the example three, military intelligence. If the threat to human dignity is implicit and sometimes hidden in the previous examples, it is obvious here. In terms of information gathering done by militaries, this is generally not performed with the consent of participants and oversight is performed by a party with particular self-interested objectives. You know, drones and satellites rarely ask for permission in the information gathering process. And while a distinction between combatants and non-combatants is frequently held, although we're seeing very clearly these days, less frequently held, 
There is also a further distinction between our non-combatants and their non-combatants, thereby suggesting a difference in the worth of human life, a distinction that becomes important if the task assigned to AI is the destruction of human life, which is frequently the point of military applications. That is to say, it merely extends the problems that are evident already. There is much more one could say about each of these examples, but I hope it is clear that they illustrate a wide gap between the aspirational rhetoric and the real world applications of AI. To address this gap, I am convinced we need to move in at least two directions at the same time. So part four, directions for moving forward. Because AI is part of a broader socio-technical system, its relation to human dignity must be addressed as such. To do so, I would encourage thinking along two parallel and reciprocal lines. One, we need to establish meaningful governments, governance and limitations of AI for the good of the entire systems. And I'm thinking perhaps something like the International Atomic Energy Agency. This has to have teeth. And two, cultivating an understanding and appreciation of human identity among the people within the subsystems that make up our global system. In essence, these two are deeply intertwined. The values of this system are determined by the people within the system, and the people within the system are valued according to the priorities of the system. I may be stating the obvious here, but I'm fairly convinced that partisan economic or material success is usually the primary um, concern for sufficient numbers of people within the US and perhaps our global system that human dignity can be usurped or limited within the constraints of fiscal efficiency and productivity. And as long as the majority of people within the system hold that view, the entire system will be governed with that view in mind, regardless of the aspirational rhetoric. Now, I admit this is a bleak vision of our current reality and it is hardly a place to conclude my comments. Yet I think that facing the challenge with clear eyes is the first step to addressing it. We can complain about the power of multinational corporation and military powers all we want, and I think it is good to do so when needed. But unless we are working to model and call others to a world in which human dignity is worth more than political power, organizational efficiency, and financial success, then we are not offering a sufficient alternative. After all, AI is merely a tool at the service of our society, and we cannot forget that it is only as good, evil, or ignorant as the people that wield it. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the speakers, and now we come to the discussion because uh, there's a limit of time, so I think we only can have for three participants. Yes, Baba. Two others. Yes, one, two. Yes, please, Baba. Good morning. Yes, this is what Dr. Undra is. Biopiracy is part of the bioethics. Thank you. Maybe can you uh, re ask? Sorry, I I couldn't um, hear very well. The um the microphone was um what was cutting off off a little bit. So just to kind of um um expand on on, on the bioethics um, program. Um, um, right, right now we are, are um, developing a um, normative instrument on um, ethics of neurotechnology and neuroscience. So um, we, right now in, in 2023, November, um, we are um, holding the um, uh, 42nd General Conference of um, UNESCO member states, which is our one of our three governing bodies. And this is the um, governing body that has um, 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 all 194 um, uh, uh, member states uh, represented and, 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 and um, giving us the mandate for, for our um, programmatic activities for, for the next two years. Um, so this is our latest um, 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 
uh, normative instrument. As, as, uh, as I mentioned, the recommendation on, on AI was um, 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 the, the previous um, iteration. Um, the IBC, the International Bioethics Committee, they also develop a lot of reports and guidelines on, on things like um, medical um, 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 ethics and bio um, ethics. Um, um, a lot of it is to do with, you know, like um, health healthcare um, uh, related stuff. I'm trying to just think of some other tangible examples. Um, um, but um, um, we also have a declaration on, on the ethics of um, um, artificial, uh, sorry, um, the ethics of um, um, climate change and, and, and climate justice. So um, what, I'm, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that um, I, I think this particular um, um, work stream is, um, has um, um, considered, you know, sort of like ethical um, um, and, um, and policy issues of, of a very um, wide, wide range of topics. And, you know, back to the um, um, interaction with the UGE and academic community, we have a UNESCO chair um, in, in bioethics um, embedded within the University of um, Gajamara and um, I'm told they do like, you know, weekly seminars, you know, looking at, you know, like lots of um, different issues. Um, you know, pertaining to, I, I believe a lot of it is focused on uh, medical, uh, medical um, ethics, but I'm, I'm not um, too familiar. So I again, just um, uh, to, to, you know, um, wrap up my uh, response, it, it is like a very um, um, intellectually um, 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 uh, wide, wide ranging um, 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 things that, that, uh, that this uh, bioethics program is, um, is considering. Is it clear enough? Do you want to continue your question? Sure. Okay. Hope okay. you sure. I, I think biopiracy is just just give me an example. When I work in Papua, there was uh, researchers from developing countries came to the indigenous people of Papua. They took some of the. Uh, quote unquote herbs or medicals, you know, uh, traditional medicals of uh, uh, materials. But then, then they uh, use that as, uh, back to their countries, they use it as a big businesses with, and leaving no, no, even no credits for this, this indigenous people in Papua. This is what I call biopiracy. I think this is a, unethical, very unethical, but is that include in, 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 in your uh, definition on, on bioethics? Thank you. Yeah, well, um, um, I suppose it's um, yes and no, because and no, we don't have very um, specific um, um, uh, projects in, in, in this area because, you know, it, it, you know the, the nature of the work is, is um, um, uh, more um, high level. So no, we don't have very, very specific um, um, programs, but, um, I, you know, you know, probably there is some um, synergy between you know some of the uh, normative guidelines that have been produced in, in different areas, and you know some of the ethical considerations in um, uh, with you know what you are uh, describing. Uh, maybe back I can I can come to you after the panel, and we can have a more specific conversation about the bioethics program it, it itself um, outside of you know the the topic of of AI. Yeah. yeah, maybe you can continue the discussion after this. <laughs> I invite the second uh, participant. Who was it? Thank you. Uh, my name is Hanau from International Islamic University. <coughs> I believe AI, like any other technology, will be benefiting both. The Your question is uh, addressed to, to... Oh, sorry. To, to uh, UNESCO. Okay. <laughs> so it's uh, I, I believe all technology will be benefiting and also will have a negative impact. As to how we see the, the benefits of, of, of online educations and UNESCO being the, the main uh, platforms to ensure that education become the leveler of the society. How do you see that AI will not be widening the gap for those who have access and those who, have, who don't have the access? Meaning that it's not a question, and I think it's a question of accountability to those who don't have access. Thank you. Um, uh, we absolutely think that you know um, um, AI can can widen the digital gap rather than than close it. Um, um, so yes, we we think um, 
um, this, this is an issue. Um, um, and again, our work, I think, is, is done at two levels. One is to um, try and provide um, 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 uh, uh, tangible policy um, um, assistance or policy recommendations which are um, targeted towards ministries of um, education to, um, um, to consider um, these um, um, uh, um, challenges. And in, in, indeed, I was uh, with an UGA professor yesterday and um, you know, she was talking about how um, you know, they recently did a field mission to like a very, very remote part of Indonesia, which got um, um, internet access last year. So, how can you talk about you know using ChatGPT in the classroom in, in a you know island um, that just got internet access you know last year? So, you know, it, it cannot be. Um, uh, it, it must be you know contextualized to you know to um, um, you know the reality. Um, in, in a way, I think this is something that we are trying to achieve with the Panchasila uh, publication that we did, you know, to kind of, you know, try and bring these, um, 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 you, know, um, you know, global or aspirational um, 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 uh, principles in, into, um, um, in, into, you know, like national context and, you know, if you can go even more local um, beyond that, that, um, um, that would be fantastic. And I guess the second um, uh, layer is the capacity building work where we, you know, try and work with um, Institutions to try and um, um, uh, increase um, the um, 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 you know access you know the the you know digital upskilling we call it you know I think um, we've we've been um, uh, trying to work with um, um, both companies and with um, um, government entities that are trying to um, um, upskill uh, uh, people in 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 you know in 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 this regard but. Um, um, Obviously, the, the the number one is is um, good uh, good policy making. Um, so yes, we we do um, we, um, um, consider this as as a um, something that could be a driver for inequality, and you know it's not all just um, you know like fantastic and, and great. And maybe what I could actually uh, do is um, hand over the uh, microphone with you know the permission of the moderator to my fellow panelist, um, Dr. Preeti, because I think she will want to um, add to this as well. Uh, very, very interesting. Do uh, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, I, I, I do, um, you know, consider the question in a very positive way because uh, I think this is not something we can, you know, just brush away the, the kind of a, uh, importance. Like I am coming back to the concept of chat GPT. Chat GPT has opened up a lot of other areas for those very new people, new as in new to the you know, education or maybe higher education or maybe into the kind of a research or something. But at the same time, uh, we, we cannot we cannot say that no, they have to, I mean, total ban is, is never an answer to any of these, you know, challenges. And then uh, the more we are open about it, more we are accepting it as a part of our uh, entire thing, the more we'll be able to manage it well in, a, in an ethical way. And I'm sure as uh, Paul has also raised a question of uh, human dignity, because we cannot at any given point of time, um, you know, give away the entire concept of human dignity to machines and we cannot let them behave the, the way they want to behave. And I'm talking about machines here. So I guess uh, it's a very, um, you know, initial phase. And then if we, if we um, you know, try and take it head on right now, because we cannot let it pass through the system and then we just go and, you know, close certain doors and this and that. I think UNESCO is on a very important, you know, kind of a threshold right now when you are already in the process of making certain guidelines and certain, you know, do's and don'ts. The only um, concern is the timeline, how fast we all will reach out to all the beneficiaries because then we are dealing with a very, very fast generation right now. Unless we speed it up from our side, uh, we might lose upon certain important areas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, do you want also? No. If you want, you can you can uh, say something to Dr. Martes. Sure. Uh, no, no. Um, uh, pa Paul, I, I just wanted to um, um, uh, uh, make a uh, response to to your presentation because I, I found it you know absolutely um, very interesting. And in, in fact, I would say. Um, um, uh, um, you know, I, I um, um, you know, you were um, 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 saying with with apologies to to the UNESCO colleague, but um, uh, I completely agree with um, um, you know the things that you brought up in in, in the presentation. And indeed, um, I think it's important to look 
um, you know, in a very critical way to you know some of these you know aspirational, um, um, high-level um, um, you know um, documents that are that are coming from um, uh, various actors. But I, I don't think what you um, uh, um, um, uh, presented was it was in 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 encountered in any way to this um, you know very high-level document from um, um, you know like a UN um, agency and. Uh, uh, for sure, there is no mention of you know the ethics of you know AI as it pertains to warfare or or military, and um, 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 there's definitely no mention of it in in, in the recommendation. And you know, I think um, uh, y you have to think a little bit about how um, these um, uh, global documents come come into being. It, it's very much by com committee, um, and it has to be you know like universal principles that you know the United States, China, you know European Union countries, ASEAN, you know region. All of these countries can say, okay, you know we we are on board with this. We can we can agree to um, um, you know ratify um, this. So you know you know there's a little bit of context for how how these you know um, um, recommendations um, come out. And in the beginning, in 2019, when you know uh, we received this mandate to work on a um, global instrument on, on AI, there was you know, a question of should it be done at the recommendation level, which is entirely voluntary. It's completely up to member states whether they want to um, you know, uh, implement it or, you know, or, or um, not. There's no you know, reporting mechanism. You know, there's no voluntary review or, or um, et cetera. Or should it be not done at the declaration level, uh, which we have done before from the IBC. We've developed a um, declaration um, 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 documents and convention documents, which are a bit more um, um, binding. And the um, consensus was because AI um, is such a um, um, ever-changing and um, um, dynamic um, um, uh, field, um, it is not a space where hard laws ca um, um, can, can uh, yet exist. Um, so you know, the idea was to do it as a voluntary recommendation um, in this space where um, um, hard laws um, cannot or does not yet exist. So you know, the idea was to develop ethical um, guidelines that can be, I, I think, as a, as a starting point to, to um, um, this conversation, actually, not as an ending point. Um, so it will be, um, 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 you know, of course, in, in, in imperfect in many ways, but you know, I think ethics or you know, like ethical principles are a very good place to you know, uh, begin this um, conversation and you know, eventually you know, we will have to get more sophisticated and you will have to um, um, you know, um, think about things like you know, um, uh, regulatory frameworks and um, 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 and 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 so forth. So that's just kind of like my reflection on um, on your presentation, which was um, is which is uh, really um, interesting. And again, there will always be this gap between what we aspire to as you know, um, you know, as societies or you know, like as, as honestly as as people really, and um, and you know the in real life. Um, and you know, some of the examples that you pointed out are you know like really um, um, you know shining examples of that as well. So um, yeah, just wanted to. Um, uh, make this um, uh, uh, response because I thought it was it was really interesting the things that you um, uh, brought up. Well, well thank do you. you want to May I respond? offer a quick comment? Yeah. Do you want sure, to thank response? you. One hundred percent, I agree with you. Um, One hundred percent, I agree with you. And I and I was hoping that you wouldn't read my comments as a critique of of the content or the ambition of the the recommendation. My nervousness simply lies in the reality that. A lot of people can simply affirm the recommendation as a recommendation and then completely ignore it, or and and then um, it looks like they're affirming it, and and yet all of the money, or not all of the money, but a large majority of the money invested into AI is spent um, completely ignoring those sort of recommendations. And so I, I wanted to just simply raise that challenge for all of us as we as we move forward and and recognize that that there's is certainly there's lots of things that AI can do really well. Um, but as, as, as we've seen with other things, um, the powers that be um, tend to use them for their power. And so I, I, I'd be happy to continue conversation. I wish I was there in person, we could grab coffee and, and, and talk further, but thank you. Thank you very much. And we have our last participant. Short question, please. Okay, my name is Vishnu. Uh, student of uh, digital transformation and competitiveness from UGM. Actually, the question I've already questioned by Mr. Utra Ganbatar regarding the uh, using AI in the war. Uh, yes, uh, we realize that when UNESCO issued the AI recommendation is sent to the humanity, but 
in other side that EI can be used for war. So the question is how, f how far or how effective the AI recommendation uh, from UNESCO to regulate the AI using in the war. Because as we know that if the can one country has the sophisticated AI, perhaps the possibility he will win the war is big. That's the question. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, thank you for, for that question. And again, I think it, um, it's very similar to what um, um, I, I said to, um, 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 uh, in, in response to um, uh, my um, Paul, my panel, panelist. There is nothing in, in, in the recommendation about the use of AI in, um, um, in warfare or in, in, um, um, in um, military technology. And um, it, uh, frankly, it's just you know, um, real life. You, know, you have to consider the context in which these um, um, UN um, um, instruments are, are made. Um, so it was not something that um, uh, was included in, in the final um, um, document. Um, and, and again, I, I will, you know, maybe just you know uh, reiterate that you know bec just because it's it's it, recommendation is is a voluntary set of guidelines. Um, and I think the um, onus now on, on on me as someone working for UNESCO in in, in a regional context in a field office, um, it, it's to um, to work with national st um, stakeholders like you know. Um, government, um, um, academia, and certainly the private sector to kind of um, 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 elaborate on, on, you know, on, on, on these um, issues, but you know, they are in entirely um, 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 voluntary. We can um, offer member states you know, these um, frameworks, we can offer best practices, we can offer an international platform for dialogue, for um, conversation. Um, we can um, um, you know, deploy you know, resources like you know, um, technical experts. Um, um, but um, it's um, it, it's very much an advisory role that the, um, the UN plays um, to to national um, uh, stakeholders. So maybe you know just to kind of um, um, clarify the you know the purpose and the um, um, uh, limitations of, of a, um, um, a recommendation or um, normative um, guideline instrument. Well, dear participants, before I end this session. Let me give a short conclusion. We cannot escape AI for all areas of our life. AI is not to replace the role of humans, but to help. And since AI is closely related to privacy, so ethics must be put at the forefront. Thank you very much for the presenters, for the wonderful presentations, and thank you very much for everybody. This is the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Widawati and Miss Umbrell. And also, thank you very much for Miss Priti Oza. Hi, hello. And also for Paul Martins, thank you. Um, thank you for participants for giving uh, your attention here and your thoughts. So uh, looking forward to uh, have you all again in the next session. Yeah. After this panel, we will have a short coffee break. And after that, we still have six panels in parallel session that will start at 10, uh, 10 15 a.m. And then two special panels that will start at 12, 30 p.m. And also main session four with the team Ethical leadership and sustainable governance that will start at 2:15 p.m. After that, all we we hope all of us will gather again in this auditorium for closing ceremony with some announcements of award winners of best paper and best presentation with case awards. So hopefully, all the speakers and uh, participants can join this session until the end of uh, ceremony. Maybe one of you will get a Best Speakers uh, Award. Thank you. And